Welcome to our podcast on the ground up, where we interview startup founders exploring their journeys, their successes, challenges, and lessons learned. We hope you'd be inspired in discovering what it takes to build a thriving startup. I'm your host, Jake Aaron Villarreal, and here with us today we have Yoshi Yokokawa, the founder and CEO of Alpaca, a $120 million funded startup out of Y Combinator. It's a fascinating story. Hope you enjoy. Yoshi, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here. Great. So a little bit about Yoshi. He's the co-founder and CEO of Alpaca, a California-based fintech company that offers an API brokerage platform that hundreds of businesses globally build their stock and crypto investing products with. Alpaca raised over $120 million in funding and has also been backed by Y Combinator. A great story. And I want to dive in, Yoshi, on your company. But before we do that, talk to us a little bit about where you're from originally and what led you to America. Sure. Um, I was uh, born uh, and raised in Japan. And then, uh, you know, I was uh, going back and forth after um, graduating from uh, college. And uh, I think like, you know, the reason why really I moved uh, to the, uh, you know, the Bay Area is that my co-founder Hitoshi was there and has been there for a pretty long time, uh, being uh, one of the key engineers at the, uh, uh, you know, the Bay Area company. And he just told me, if we are doing a startup, we have to go to the major league baseball, which <laughs> means that you have to be in California. And that, that is really the key reason why uh, uh, we moved to the, uh, the Bay Area, United States. Got it. So for you, it was about building a company and knowing proximity to Silicon Valley or the Bay Area was important to do it. Um, how long were you in the Bay Area? Because now, now I think you're back in Japan now currently. Is that correct? That is correct. I, uh, am currently in, uh, Kyoto, Japan. Um, uh, and I was in the uh, Bay Area for, uh, I think six years until the, uh, pandemic, uh, started, uh, in, I think like, you know, a couple of years ago. Got it. Great. Now, who's the engineer or are both of you engineers amongst your co-founders? So, uh, you know, since we're doing this, uh, uh, fintech, uh, uh, we had to have this kind of combination of understanding of the industry as well as a very deep uh, knowledge about how to deal with the data and database because uh, financial transactions is all about the data. So uh, my co-founder Hitoshi comes from a very deep uh, database uh, background. He's uh, one of the key uh, contributor to uh, open source uh, of the uh, post community. And that's how he uh, basically like, you know, made him into the uh, Bay Area uh, engineering community from uh, him really like, you know, grew up in Japan as well. Uh, and then I come from uh, more of the financial services background. Uh, I started my career originally at uh, Lehman Brothers. So I was uh, one of the guys who was uh, packaging and repackaging uh, subprime mortgages uh, back then when, uh, you know, great financial crisis happened. Interesting times. Definitely. <laughs> wow. Sounds like a good combination, though. You've got industry experience and he's got the technical experience. You know, in 2012, fintech was being disrupted in very different ways. And a company called Acorns was one that was down the street from us that we really helped build their engineering and really some of the early pioneers for the company joined. Um, they've since raised $500 million to have two, three, 400 people on staff and really, I think, kind of set the bar of how to get financially in, in the business, but also, you know, get, got approved by FINRA and regulations. What was the opportunity you saw in fintech with Alpaca? And what, what inspired you to really launch that platform? Sure. Uh, by the way, I love the Acorns. Like they recently launched this uh, new card by the, the Brock, the way yeah. said, which I, you know, which oof, I follow on the Instagram and everything. I was like, whoa, this is really cool. <laughs> yeah. On that note, it's funny that you say that because uh, I was watching uh, Jimmy Fallon and I saw The Rock on yeah. Jimmy Fallon yeah. talking about. Yeah, I saw that too. Man. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, exactly. Oh my God, I know all those guys. That's crazy. <laughs> yes. That was really cool. Yeah, yeah, it is super cool, super cool. But, but yeah, anyway, um, yeah, we saw, we saw Acorns, uh, we saw Robin Hood, uh, you know, we saw Wealthfront and, uh, you know, all those guys came out. Um, you know, when we started this, uh, business, we were really like struggling to find actually like what is really the next, right? Because I think like Acorns did like amazing job, uh, to really, you know, approach to new generations and new, um, you know, group of the people in the United States who has, who was not really like, you know, touched by the incumbent players of, uh, you know, Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade or like all those, all those big guys. 
And then, uh, you know, Robinhood did even like, you know, made like, you know, push that like, you know, whole boundaries into like a millennial, uh, to the investing and trading. So, you know, when definitely like, you know, when we came into, um, you know, okay, what can we do? Uh, we really had a struggle, but then like, you know, I think I realized at that point, there's like two phenomena was happening around like, you know, uh, uh, 2016, 2017, no, actually it was just 2000, when we were formulating the idea was the one phenomena was that, uh, this is really, um, you know, the developers and the engineers were having more power, uh, than before. And they continue to be the case, but like, you know, there's a more coding schools, um, you know, that in school, like more people are taking computer science instead of finance and business. And then like, you know, younger generations, uh, understood that being able to make something and engineer something is that being able to code. So I think like, you know, that whole, uh, trend is becoming very obvious around that time. So that was like one key phenomena that we saw. And another thing was that, uh, when, uh, talking about trading and investing, uh, there is also the another community that was getting very much, uh, you know, hyped up, uh, for the uh, automation of investing. Um, and the automation of investing, meaning that it's more like DIY, do it yourself, um, uh, you know, hedge fund, do it, do it yourself, uh, you know, algorithmic trading, uh, especially, uh, you know, led by this company called Quantopian, uh, which was, uh, you know, eventually bought out by Robinhood. But these two key things that realized, uh, you know, made us realize that, oh, maybe like, you know, instead of targeting millennials and the new generations, maybe like, you know, we target the different angles of the sectors of the people that who was not like really served by anyone, which was the, uh, you know, API which is the developers. So that's like how we thought that there was an opportunity just really focusing on that double down to the community. So talk about the developers. Um, you know, in in the US today, there's lots of regulations and you can now develop technologies for financial services and medical and a, a number of different categories. That's in the US. When we start talking about other countries and there's a big world out there, you know, there's other regulations and maybe some easier and harder countries to build in. What's your approach to international and taking your platform to, you know, other countries? Sure. Um, you know, when we launched our um, first product in 2000, uh, uh, we really didn't think about global or international. The only thing that we knew we wanted to do was that if we are to launch product, we want to target um, as many as people as possible in the vertical of developers and like you know, if you think about developers obviously there's not only in the united states there are a lot of people in india there's a lot of people in you know everywhere in the world so we just wanted to think about that how we can target them and obviously we realized and understood there's a uh, you know more to that that like you're not just selling the SaaS or like you know some tech products to everyone uh you know we are heavily regulated by FINRA and SEC and at the same time, if we go outside of the countries, there's a different countries, regulators who are thinking similar way that FINRA and NCC is thinking for their citizens. Uh, so like, you know, we definitely like, you know, are very careful and understood like you know, how we can or we cannot do. And, but like, I think like it really comes down from uh, our understanding, fundamental uh, understanding of like, you know, what that um, regulators roles are. And I think like, you know, the, anywhere you go in terms of like, you know, this, uh, wealth and brokerage uh, regulation, there's only two things that you really have to think about and understand fundamentally. And first thing is the investor protection. Um, you know, regulators do care about their, uh, you know, the people. So like, you know, if those, like if in the US, if Americans are like lied to or manipulated by something that should not be, the regulators gets very upset. That's their job to protect the Americans. So like, you know, the protection of the investors is a very, very important first thing. And the second thing is that, uh, you know, the, the protection of the market. So like, you know, you don't want like, you know, gangsters money, uh, or like, you know, mafia money buying up some countries that's, uh, you know, publicly listed. So you want to make sure that you're protecting the money, uh, 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 flowing into the system is always healthy, which is like money laundering, anti-money laundering. People call it always AML, KYC, all those things. So like, you know, as long as you are really thinking about those two fundamental things, you know, you can, you know, somehow figure it out, uh, even though you go international. So talk a little bit about, you know, the developers, you have a platform that developers can build on top of what's the talked about the, the infrastructure and the business model that you have. 
Because I think for listeners that don't know Alpaca and don't know about what you're bringing to market, kind of high level, 30,000 foot, what exactly are you providing to the market and why are the developers excited about it? Sure. I think like, you know, the, there are two, two things that we do or like, you know, two groups of the people that we look at, um, uh, that like, you know, who use our product. The first thing that we launched with was really the API version of Robinhood. That's what we try to be. Like Robinhood is like, you know, very seamless user experience for the, you know, people who touches mobile interface. And then, you know, you can buy and sell, short sell, whatever, uh, the stocks and crypto. So why don't we make that into API? So that was really original idea. Because like, you know, the, there are still, and there's at the time, uh, you know, the people who are trying to access, uh, Robinhood via, uh, you know, API, which is not exposed. And then, you know, that has been the, always the problem because, uh, you know, the, you know, the investing flow, trading flow that's coming from API and the trading flow that's coming from the more mobile interface is actually considered very differently on the back end. So, you know, the Robinhood has been always kind of reluctant to take those orders and the, they're not even exposing that. So that's kind of hacking. So like, you know, we just said, okay, we are the ones that if you want to trade API, we're the version of it, right? And in order to do that, we had to build a similar architecture behind the scene, like, you know, including regulations and then books and records and all those things. So that's what we offer. We are the, you know, just a brokerage farm, just like Robinhood or Acorns, but like, you know, who offers the uh, developer interface, which is API instead of mobile app. So that's what we offer. And so like, you know, for the pro- pro- programmatic trading wise, that is the case. But then, you know, there's a bunch of the people and groups of the people and the businesses who started using our product to actually build their own version of Robinhood. So oh, okay. like, you know, yeah. So like, you know, there's a mobile app uh, and then, you know, some people are, okay, I think I can build better version of the Robinhood without really, you know, knowing what's behind the scene. Like you know, people think that, right? Like, you know, because, because Robinhood and Acorns did a beautiful job of this is just a, you know, app instead of financial services. So people tend to think that, oh, okay, like, you know, as long as you build beautiful app, you know, it should work. You know, the, the reality is different, but, you know, that was a good kind of starting point for the people to, you know, do the entrepreneurship journey. So that's really also the platform that, you know, we have made it to be. And that's eventually like now used by the, um, you know, 150 businesses who are actually building their own version of investing applications. And now that happened to be to the United States, different types of the group of the people, maybe to the people in the different countries who have a different cultures, different languages. So those are like kind of two things that we do and we offer, but we're really the, uh, you know, brokerage uh, company and the interface happens to be a uh, developer interface, which is API. Got it. That's great. So talk a little bit about your business model. Cause you have like three different offerings, um, Walk us through those offerings and what that looks like. Yeah. So like our offering is really like, you know, we think about it like, you know, very simply uh, about like, you know, what we do, but like, you know, we really think that um, access to the stock market, ETF, crypto, and that can be done by API. So it's programmable. You can do it, you know, roll it into your algorithmic trading. You can roll that into uh, part of your uh, app that you have already, you can do that because like it's API, it can be embeddable. So that's what we do. And in terms of the business model that we do, uh, it's very similar to any other brokerage companies out there that includes like Acorns or Robinhood or even Charles Schwab or TD Ameritrade. You know, we make money from the transaction, which is trading volume. And then we also make money from the uh, interest, uh, you know, the cash and the securities, all those things. And then also like some of the subscriptions, because we do offer a lot of uh, support when the developers are implementing our API into their services and systems. And then, you know, we have to provide, you know, support to do that. So like, you know, that those kind of three things are our revenue model. That's great. So if I'm a developer and I'm sitting in Dubai, for example, and I want to yeah. bring a product to market. I don't have the the team to really build out the infrastructure to create a Robin Hood, but I know that I could probably market this pretty well if I could just create, you know, some way to I don't know connect with my users, building out a user user interface, the front end, whatever it happens to be, uh, without having all the back end needs of engineering. I could literally like just launch my own service and product and basically become an entrepreneur without all the headaches of the back end. Exactly. So what we take care of is that, you know, what we people say, middle, mid office and back office. 
So compliance, um, you know, reporting, regulatory stuff, that's mid office, back office. That's what we do as an infrastructure. What you really think about is, as you said, how to acquire customers and how to provide the best user experience uh, to the people that you're targeting to. So yes, like an answer to the question is yes. Got it. That's great. How many countries are you in today? Right now, we work with the uh, uh, businesses from 25 different countries. That's great. And you went out and you raised, you know, $120 million, a lot of money. Um, what's the employee size like today? And as you grow, what's your thoughts about, you know, really on-site versus remote? It's a new world, a lot of different <laughs> playbooks around how you do that. What's your thoughts yeah. there? Um, so the, from the result, like, you know, we are a remote only company. And then, you know, we have employees around like 135 or so. Um, and, you know, those are also spread it out into like 30 different countries. Um, nice. And uh, very remote first. Um, the, and the, like our thoughts process is that um, I think like, you know, it comes from the actual practicalness and then also uh, our mission and vision. It like both of them led to where we are. And our mission uh, is to open financial services access to everyone on the planet. So, which is 8.5 billion people. So that is really something that we're like seriously trying to go after, which means that like you, in order to get everyone, you really need to understand everyone, which means that like, you know, if we are just in the one place, uh, and then like, you know, having, having to try and understand all those people, I think it's just very impossible. That's what I felt. And this is really coming from my background. Um, you know, grew up in Japan, uh, you know, learned and studied and like worked in the United States. Like, you know, there's a very, very different cultures just in those two countries who have like similar economic, um, you know, level and background. Um, and, but then like, you know, if we go to like, you know, completely different continents, like it's even farther different, right? So like I, we even don't have no clue like what's happening into those like, you know, parts of the world. And in order for us to understand, like we have to have like very diverse um, members who's working for Alpaca, who continue to give us the feedback, like, you know, each other so that we're doing the best job to serve, uh, you know, those companies and entrepreneurs who are, you know, building businesses uh, in all those places. So that really like required us to be globally diversified. And that's the first reason. And the second reason why is that before, uh, you know, pandemic happened, we were a very much physical office company like, uh, like any other companies in the Bay Area. We had a San Mateo, uh, we had the office in San Mateo. Uh, and then we had around like 20 people in the office, uh, you know, five people, you know, remote, like, you know, some people are remote. Um, but what we've always felt was that there's always this kind of segregation between the kind of first class employee and the second class employee. Because like, you know, if you have like, you know, core members, 20 people in the office, like things are happening in the office, right? Like, you know, that you write in the whiteboard, and like you discuss there over the lunch, over the coffee, whereas those people who are remote for five people, they don't know what's going on. So it's, they're always late or like they're not like inside of the circle of the understanding what's happening. So, you know, when we went, we are forced to go to like, you know, full remote because of the pandemic, you know, we realized that it has to be one way or another, which is full hundred percent office or it's full hundred percent remote. Because if 100% remote, you're forced to communicate. Everyone has to communicate, um, you know, virtually. And that makes it fair to everyone. So those two kind of realizations uh, basically led us to be where we are and that we continue to be uh, the remote-only company. And that, you know, gives us a leverage that, you know, we continue to work and hire from everywhere in the world with a very different, you know, cultural backgrounds and very, you know, different places that, you know, they have a very strength in while, like, you know, having the fair, like, kind of, one group of the people with the one team because everyone's remote. Yeah, that's great. You made a decision. You're moving forward with it. I like it. Yeah. What's the playbook that works for you and your company in terms of managing people remotely where you can identify how to support them with the right tooling, the right systems so that they're, you know, feeling like you're, you're, you're backing them up, but also ensuring that they're performing at a high level. Uh, that's a very, very different uh, difficult question, Jake. Like, and that's something uh, we continue to, uh, I guess, like, you know, suffer and figure out, like, you know, try and error. I, I feel like the um, who is good in the office environment may not be good in the, you know, remote only company. And the people who is really good at remote only company may not be good in the office environment. So I think like, you know, we have to embrace that fact that 
like, you know, that some capabilities and the skill sets are definitely required. Like if it's like in a remote only company. And like, you know, I think the, uh, you, we firstly like kind of be honest, have to be honest about it and have to accept it. And that's the first thing. And the second thing is that, um, you know, definitely like, you know, touch points, uh, uh, of the, um, like, you know, the people who work with closely and the people who you don't work closely, uh, becomes very important. So like, you know, there's of course, like more kind of catch up meetings and that we do, uh, have kind of, you know, physical meetups. Uh, it's not like for everyone, but like, it's really like smaller groups of the people, like, you know, five to 10 people gathering here and there, you know, that allows the people to really like, you know, see each other eyes to eyes, especially, you know, the members from the different teams that we need to collaborate. And that had been pretty, um, useful and impactful, uh, when like, you know, creating the one culture. Yeah, that's, that's great. You know, there's a lot of technologies that are coming out now that really can understand the behaviors and the habits of the performers within your company, which can really be useful in how you model uh, and coach your remote employees, which I think is gaining a lot of traction in a good way. Um, yeah. You know, you've got clients in the Middle East, Southeast Asia, North America, other locations. What's worked for you to get traction around the world? It's one thing to come up with the product, but it's another to actual market and get growth in, you know, countries that are not where you live today and not maybe where your employees happen to be. Yeah. I think like, you know, our key, um, component is that even though we are a financial services company, like Acorns or Robinhood or even, you know, like other incumbents and just like Acorns or Robinhood were, you know, non financial services company, uh, to the, you know, front end, right? Because people consider Charles Schwab, oh, they're a financial services company, and they, we know they are a financial services company. If you look at the Acorns or, you know, the Rock, people <laughs> think that that's really cool service and app. And they don't think about that as, oh, this is like a you know, full ledge heavy financial services in this company. And I think that's the same thing for us. You know, people consider us just a developer tool. We're just an API. You know, API and developer tool is good for the developer community and the developer community doesn't care where they live. They always remote, they have been always remote, and they always talk to each other in a remote basis on the, you know, the forums on the internet and everything. So that's how we really like, you know, gained our traction, continue to gain our traction. So we never really cared about, okay, this is where, or the regions that, you know, we want to be, uh, you know, known for, but like we really double down how we can be known and used by the developers. And those developers tend to be, you know, the U S or, you know, somewhere in the Southeast Asia or you know, Middle East or Africa or Latin, and they, you know, continue to come to us and try to use our product. So that's how we've really, you know, made the whole kind of word of mouth spinning into the community of the developers who touch our API and try out our APIs. That's interesting. When it comes to uh, your company in terms of growth, uh, you raise a lot of money and you've got a lot of employees today. As you look into the future, you know, in fintech and financial services in general, it's been a tough market for a lot of companies. What's what's your growth strategy going into 2024? Sure. I think like, you know, one uniqueness that we have is that, um, you know, our business is super globally distributed. I think like, you know, when um, the conversations happen about, you know, some industries is having a difficult time. There's of course, like, you know, the macro trend about, you know, high interest rate and all those things, but there's always granularity and there's a, like, you know, it's not a black and white. For example, like, you know, there's still a lot of like, you know, healthy, um, you know, money out there, for example, to the Middle East. And that is the reason why the American Silicon Valley VCs continue to visit them to raise money there. And, you know, there's a, you know, those micro trends that, you know, we are exposed to because like we are so distributed in terms of a crime base. So like, you know, yes, there's like, you know, some client base that who are in the regions that got affected the most are maybe having a very difficult time, but those like, you know, the companies who are in the not so affected regions or countries are growing really fast. So we're very much distributed in that sense. Uh, so we're very much protected because of that. With that said though, uh, you know, to going into the 2024, um, I think like you know, our strategy continue to be really supporting our clients, how they can also make revenue. Because like, you know, as they make revenue and they grow, that's going to be growth for us. So like, you know, we are focusing on providing in a way the tool, like more tools and the weapons so that like, you know, the, our partners can, you know, launch new products, uh, to make more revenue. So like, you know, that's really what we are focusing on. So like, you know, we are even accelerating our product development to launch new, uh, asset classes, new products, 
uh, that like you know our partners can utilize and then you know build on so that they can make more revenue and money. You talk about asset classes. Talk about crypto. How much uh, is crypto part of your business and part of your strategy going forward? As of right now, in terms of the revenue, it's not much. Like you know, definitely like you know the you know the, the there's a winter. Uh, you know, hope that now it's kind of you know getting a lot of clarity, I guess, compared to like six or nine months ago, uh, even in the United States. So I'm very hopeful and I'm very optimistic. Um, and in terms of the strategy, uh, crypto is definitely a big part of it. Uh, we have been uh, always a big believer uh, in the uh, you know concept of that and like you know how it's going to take a you know you know major part of the financial services ecosystem, uh, not only with the uh, you know investment asset class. So like, you know, we've been always like, you know, looking into that and try to adapt what we can do. And that's really coming from like, you know, Hitoshi, my co-founder, uh, you know, coming from the database, um, you know, it's really like in the blockchain, uh, you know, he thinks about that very similar way. And that is why we're always like, you know, drawn into it. And then the nature of the crypto is very much open source. And that's where like our core identity comes from. Like, you know, how can we be a part of the community, how we can contribute to the community and how we can like, you know, push the open source-ness of what we do. Uh, so like in terms of longer term strategy, crypto is a very, very important component of what we do. That's that's great. Yeah, we we see a lot of growth in that area uh, on the development side. So I was just curious to know as from what you were seeing from developers that are using your platform or, or looking to build out you know, their own company. Um, when you started and you went through Y Combinator, did you have a thesis that was created that you stayed true to, or did you pivot once you got through Y Combinator to become what you are today? Um, I think like you know, when we went into Y Combinator, um, yes, like I think since then we've been true to um, you know what we've said. The the, the problem problem statement that you know we went into we, we went to Y Combinator with is that broker dealers don't have APIs. That is that one line problem that we went with. And we continue to believe that is a case. Like, you know, without like, you know, other than Alpaca, I don't think anyone really have the APIs in the brokerage sector. They say they, that's API. In our view, it's not really an API. Like if you think that you understand the API, you know, there's a certain kind of philosophy behind it, right? Because when people say API, it should be flexible. It should be contributable. It should be community. Uh, there should be a lot of like, you know, um, you know, context comes with that you are an API company or you are an API. So I think that statement continues to be true in this industry. And, you know, we're trying to be the only one and leading player to make sure that the problem is solved, solved, uh, in this, uh, brokerage, brokerage, uh, broker dealer world. Yeah, that's great. Um, as you look at your company today and you've gone through a lot of growth and some ups and the downs. What's one lesson you look back on that you wish you would have known that you could share with the, the community of other entrepreneurs that are building today? I'm, I'm learning new things like you know, every day. And I think like, you know, I, I think about this all the time, but like, you know, even reading like, you know, all those famous books, like, you know, the hard things about hard things by Ben Horowitz or, um, you know, good to great. And like, you know, those books and like, you know, I learn a lot. And then even like, you know, watching the Silicon Valley, the TV show, I think like, you know, that told me a lot. Um, I was thinking, oh, that's crazy. But like, you know, everything actually happens. <laughs> and even though you, you know that it will happen, there's no way to really prevent it. That's what I really uh, have learned. So the only way to really learn to prepare is like, you know, you go through it yourself and you react to it because it will happen inevitably. And that the, the skill set that you have to have is that you react to it as quickly as possible with no hesitation when that happens. So I think like, you know, that is something that I'm trying to like, you know, still sink in myself, uh, uh, so that like, you know, I'm not like, you know, scared of anything or like, you know, um, I don't get hit by something that that's unexpected because I, I think everything is unexpected. Yeah. Uh, that's great. Does that make sense, Jake? Like, yeah. do you feel that way? <laughs> yeah, I do. I, I think in a lot of, in a lot of ways, you, you, you always encounter things that you don't know that you have to learn on the fly, or you have fears about things that you don't, maybe it's in your head, you know, you want to do things, but you're not sure if you, how to do it, the right, right way to do it. And, you know, you're the leader, people are looking at you to make sure that you're taking them on a path that's going to succeed. And so I, I, I think there's a lot of it that is, uh, unknown and in your mind, in your head. Right. Um, but I want to kind of ask you three questions here. Some call it a lightning round. I just call it three questions. Um, yeah. you know, 
Steve Jobs was a guy that would walk around the campus when he wanted to solve problems and he would take someone with him on that walk and have discussions. For you, where do you go to think big or to brainstorm? I, I go jog. I go running. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. I do the same. Yeah. When it comes to physical activity, I'm sure it gives you a different mindset about you know, how you think about things. It's, it, what is the physical activity? It's probably jogging, but I'll just ask it again, that you feel helps you think healthy and mentally kind of keeps you, I guess, in the right frame of mind as you're, as you're building your company. I think running and swimming are two things that I do very regularly. But like, I think like when I try to meditate my thoughts uh, into something when I'm just don't know what to do, uh, I go to public bath. And this is maybe like sound weird uh, for people outside Japan, but there's a lot of public bus uh in japan especially in kyoto where i live um and then it's extremely like in a weird different situation that like obviously you have no digital activity like you're forced to kind of be yourself very local you basically you know there's no one like who's thinking business in the public bus like they're all local people and that's how i feel very much isolated and like very alone that like you know that thought process like you know just sink in it's same similar to what is that norwegian uh, the swedish people norwegian people uh, you know, do meetings in sauna, right? Like you know, yeah. you, your brain gets heated up and then it just really sparks a lot of inspiration. And I feel the same way going to public bus, uh, hot it. springs. Uh, Absolutely love it. What hack keeps your mind positive when you're going through a challenging time? I, I have like, you know, this uh, saying uh, always in my head is, oh, this is funny than fun. So that is like how I think like, you know, try to keep everything to be in a perspective of this is a comedy instead of like, oh, this is fun because you're not forcing yourself that this is fun. So that's yeah. how I think about it. Yeah, that's great. Great. Well, this has been great to learn about your company, Alpaca, and the journey you've been on. What's next for you on the roadmap as you look forward uh, and grow? Yeah, so the, the biggest thing that we're really working on is uh, launching the options trading. Uh, and uh, this has been highly, highly, highly requested since we launched our product in 2018. So it's been all, almost oh. like five years <laughs> and now we are ready with this, uh, you know, the, the raised funds and like, you know, the people that, you know, we have, you know, now work with, uh, and then the, you know, the learnings that we had, like going through the regulations and building the systems and all the internalization that we did. Now we are ready. So, uh, uh, that's, we're super, super excited that we're working on. And, um, you know, we really want to announce it to everyone that, Hey, dude, like, you know, we're finally here. We're launching yeah. this very really soon. So that's something that, you know, we're super excited about. Yeah, that's great. I can't wait to hear about that. Um, yeah. Well, Yoshi, a big shout out to you for jumping on here and telling your story. Uh, very, very insightful. If anyone listening wants to find Alpaca, where do they go? Yes, uh, please go to the uh, our website, alpaca.markets. It's an alpaca.com. Uh, we're not that rich yet to buy that alpaca.markets <laughs> or uh, alpaca eight headquarter uh, on the X Twitter LinkedIn uh, uh, like we're on there uh, constantly so please do check it check us out yeah great well a huge shout out again to you Yoshi for joining and to all our listeners for listening it world means the world to me that you've taken your time to spend it with us today my name is Jake Aaron Villarreal signing off for now but can't wait to connect with you all in the next episode. Until then, take care. Before we wrap up, I want to give a big shout out to all the entrepreneurs that have joined to make this podcast possible. And for all the listeners for listening, it means the world to me that you chose to spend your time with us today. I'm your host, Jake Aaron Villarreal, signing off for now. We can't wait to connect with you all soon on the next episode. Take care. This show is sponsored by Match Relevant, a company that helps venture back startups find the best people in the market, and they do it in three simple steps. First, they sit down with founders to understand their story. Second, they tell their story into multiple candidate channels. And third, they schedule interviews within 48 hours. Find us at matchrelevant.com to learn more about how we do it.